，各位 members。We have a quorum, and it's also the appointed time for the meeting. Before we start with the agenda, let me remind members that the panel will go to visit Cyberport on the 16th of May, 2017. The Secretariat has already informed members about the arrangements for the visit and related matters on the 5th of May. Only four members have registered to take part in the visit. I hope to invite members to. Pay a visit to Cyber Port if you have the time. This is quite a new arrangement because you can talk directly to new technology startups. I have some forms with me here. If you're interested, please let us know, and the secretariat will give you a form to register. I hope more members will attend this Cyber Port activity. Item one on the agenda: information papers issued since the last meeting. The secretariat issued two information meet,、uh, papers, and the details are in the revised agenda. Item two, date of next meeting, and items for discussion. The next regular meeting will be held on the 12th of June, 2017, a Monday, at 2:30 in Room Three. The administration is proposing to discuss one, review of the broadcasting ordinance and the telecommunications ordinance, and two, progress report on innovation and technology fund for better living and digital inclusion. These are two, the first two items in the list of outstanding items for discussion. Some CI panel meeting or members、uh, have shown concern to us. Item two, and、uh, I have invited them to take part in the next meeting. If there are no questions, we will start item three, which is implementation of the spectrum utilization fee charging scheme for spectrum assigned administratively. Let us invite the administration to come in. The administration, can you now walk us through the proposal with your PowerPoint, and then the floor will be open to members for questions. Who will do the presentation? Yes. DS for Commerce and Economic Development, Ms. Julina Chan. Thank you, Chairman. I will say a few words as opening remarks, Chairman. Members. This paper informs members of the government's plan to implement the charging scheme for the spectrum utilization fee for spectrum assigned administratively. The decision to introduce the charging scheme was taken in 2011, and the panel supported the scheme. And then, after some public consultation, it is decided that we should introduce this spectrum utilization fee, or SUF, on the policy level.、Um, Spectrum or radio spectrum is a tr precious public asset. We like to charge the SUF so that people will make use of spectrums most efficiently. The uh, policy um, is based on the radio spectrum policy framework made in 2007,、uh, so that we can have the most cost-effective way to use spectrum for the benefit of society. We will now use. A PowerPoint to let you know the background of the plan,、uh, including the 2007 radio spectrum policy framework, the principles therein, and also in 2011, how we assign the frequency bands, and also the decision to charge an SUF on frequency bands assigned administratively, and also what we have already done in order to implement the. Fee charging scheme and also the way forward, and then we'll be happy to take questions. Mr. Patrick Lee, PAS. Thank you, Chairman. Let me now talk about the background. In Hong Kong, there are two ways to assign frequency bands according to the 2007 radio spectrum policy framework.、Um, if、uh, there is competition for some spectrums, we will assign them by auction. 
um, like those used by mobile network operators, but for those which are not competed for, like uh, those for electronic news gathering and broadcast, we will assign them administratively upon application. Today, this SUF is about the second way of assigning spectrum, and that is a spectrum assigned administratively. In the 2007 radio spectrum policy framework, we have um, established a principle, and that is we will charge SUF to make sure that precious public assets will be made use of in the best way, and also to encourage operators in order to um, allow them to use more state-of-the-art technology and to prevent waste of uh, spectrums. We will see how the spectrum is assigned in order to charge the fee, say, for mobile services. If it is assigned by market forces, say, for example, auction, then the SUF will be decided by that auction. As for spectrum assigned administratively, we will use the way of opportunity costs for assigning the spectrum as the, or you can call this the alternative course in order to assign the spectrum and charge the SUF. Let to emphasize that since um, this is assigned administratively and it is not competed for, we still would like to uh, charge the SUF to make sure that there will be the best use of SUF for the benefit of society. In 2011, we conducted a public consultation, we received 10 submissions and the industry supported in majority the charging of SUF for spectrum uh, assigned administratively. Later, I will talk about what we mean by congested spectrum. Also, in December 2010, we came to this panel to introduce the uh, proposal and we received the support of members. After the public consultation and considering different views, in September 2011, the Secretary for CED and the former TA issued a joint statement to explain the decision on the matter. Now I'd like to defer to OFCA colleagues in order to uh, let members know the exact proposal for SUF. Chairman, in 2011, the former TA decided to make use of the following principle to charge the SUF. First, that the um, frequency is already congested, meaning it is 75% or more occupied, and that these frequency bands are ex anticipated to become more congested in future. It is also decided that there will be exemption, uh, say, for example, frequency bands uh, used for public interest, some which are temporary assigned, and also 2.4 um, Wi-Fi bands. And the former TA then assigned eight frequency bands, and in these include um, the seven eight gigahertz band, and for news gathering, and also for satellite uplinks, and also the electronic news gathering outside broadcast links. I will now defer yet to another colleague to tell you how the fees will be charged. Thank you. We are going to use the least cost alternative or LCA approach. Um, for example, from the left of the PowerPoint, you will see that if the operator uses the assigned frequency band, say for example, the cost is $3,000. But if he doesn't use the assigned frequency band and he goes for the first alternative to um, transmit data, and if it is $4,000, then we will charge the cost difference. We will know uh, what the value of the assigned frequency band is. And so the SUF will be the cost difference between the current operation and its least cost alternative. In 2011, we made a decision, and this is about the actual operation. We understand that charging SUF will affect the users, and so we have decided there will be a transitional period of five years. Thank you. For the first two years, there's no need to pay the fee. In the third year, uh, you have to pay 30%. In the fourth year, 70%. And in the fifth year, the full uh, SUF. Now, 
since the purpose is to uh, I encourage better utilization, we have a one-off allowance arrangement. In the first two years, if you return the spectrum, you are provided with an economic incentive that amounts to 10% of the SUF, annual SUF, or uh, the other actual cost for migrating to other means, uh, the lower of the two. Uh, and this is to encourage uh, better utilization. <coughs> and now to implement the SUF, uh, we have done uh, some uh, work. And uh, uh, so first uh, we will uh, set the fees for uh, the end of 2017 uh, and uh, uh, to implement it at the end of 2017 and 2018, early 2018. And we have uh, notified the uh, frequent spectrum users in uh, April 2017 and uh, the OFCA uh, in mid-2017 will review the utilization rates and set the actual fees. Uh, and uh, the uh, we expect that uh, the, in the second half we will uh, pro uh, propose the uh, subsidiary legislation and implementation will be uh, at the end of uh, 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 early next year. Uh, uh, now, uh, Mr. Ma Fong Kwok, uh, five minutes. Now, I agree with these proposals in principle because these are scarce resources and should be utilized effectively. But after you charge a fee, will you affect those with uh, substantial actual needs? Uh, now, there are uh, eight specified frequency bands that uh, will be charged uh, fees. Now, uh, your threshold is 75% utilization. Now, what are the actual utilization rates for these eight bands? Now, which of those have uh, already exceeded the 75% threshold utilization? And for these eight bands, uh, will there be a mechanism to add or uh, remove uh, from this uh, set of eight bands? Uh, and maybe after you uh, charge the fee and people return to you, the frequency bands and the uh, utilization rates drop. And also, for uh, electronic news gathering and outside broadcasting, uh, now I note that the uh, uh, media organizations uh, do not support the charging of the fees. They think this is for public interest, but the government still feels that uh, fees should be charged. Now, there are two free uh, TV stations. Uh, there's, uh, 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 now, ATV has already closed, uh, and then there will be new entrants. Now, how do you assess the later situation? There are still three uh, TV stations, and there will be a new one. Uh, what change will that mean for the uh, frequency bands? Uh, how will you calculate the usage? How do you calculate the 75%? Is it an, by average or the peak period utilization? And another question is, now, if they feel that uh, as users, they cannot afford these SUF rates, uh, are there alternatives that they can embark on, uh, uh, as the government referred to? What are the criteria? Who will respond? Uh, Ms. Chen, uh, Deputy Secretary, I will answer one or two of the questions and then the OFCA can respond. 
Now, Mr. Ma asked uh, whether in the future whether there will be a mechanism for addition or subtraction uh, from the uh, frequency bands. Yes, every five years we will review the utilization of the bands and for electronic news gathering, uh, TVB, uh, ATV, uh, when they uh, directly broadcast the news, will there be changes? Uh, would there be additions or subtractions? Now, before we got set uh, at, at the end of this year, in the middle of this year, uh, the OFCA will review again the several frequency bands to see whether they are still congested. When the ATV stops operating, will there be uh, vacated bands uh, so that uh, the bands are no longer within the 75% criteria. So perhaps the OFCA will respond to that and on how to calculate the 75% uh, OFCA. Uh, Mr. Leung, uh, uh, we like to explain uh, the points raised by Mr. Ma. Firstly, the eight uh, frequency bands, how is, are they utilized? Now, in 2011, when we set the eight frequency bands, the utilization rates were over 75%. And it's true that after a few years, things have changed. Uh, the, and ma it's mainly that in April 2016, uh, ATUE's license was not uh, was renewed, so we recovered some of the frequency bands. So two of these eight uh, have uh, have uh, utilization rates now below 75. Now, uh, so the utilization rates are from 67 percent to 100 percent right now. So when we uh, formalize the legislation. Uh, it's possible that we may remove two of the frequency bands where the transition rate is less than 75%. And Mr. Ma uh, asked whether, uh, why we want to include the electronic news gathering and the outside broadcasting. Now, uh, they are, it's different from uh, the uh, 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 the broadcasting where the uh, uh, so, uh, because it provides uh, uh, information and entertainment, uh, we uh, we treat treat it this way. But uh, uh, in in other cases, uh, you can use uh, mobile phones to uh, uh, upload the data to the control centers, and uh, you and there when there are uh, functions in. Uh, uh, stadiums uh, uh, where, where there's fixed network, uh, they do not have to use the outside broadcasting uh, frequency bands. So uh, they have a choice. So if they make use of the frequency band, they have to pay the fee. If not, they can procure the service by other means. Now, just now, Mr. Ma asked uh, uh, whether uh, the, uh, the rates uh, are stand for the uh, peak usage or what. Now, usually uh, we assign a frequency band and they use it. Now, they can utilize the band within uh, uh, any uh, any time within the period. And uh, so this is a protected band. It wouldn't be used by anybody else. So the utilization rate uh, uh, is uh, uh, wholly devoted to their use, uh, and that's the way we work out the hundred, the utilization rate. So that means they occupy the band, but they don't actually may not utilize it. Yes, it's like for electronic news gathering; it wouldn't be used 24 hours a day. There may be time periods when it's not being used, but because it's been assigned to them. Uh, it cannot be used by anybody else at the same venue, uh, because otherwise there would be a mutual, a mutual interference. Any other members have questions? Now, uh, I have a question. Now, right now, the government proposed uh, this new arrangement Is it your consideration 
that these uh, spectrums being precious resources for Hong Kong would be better utilized? Would there be incentive for these uh, organizations to better utilize the spectrums? And if they uh, are charged the fee, what uh, financial pressure will it exert on these organizations? Perhaps uh, some costs would be increased and the public might be affected? Who will respond? Uh, the Deputy Secretary, I will try to answer the question. Now, as we said at the beginning, uh, we charge the fee to encourage better utilization. Uh, it's not charging for uh, for all uh, assigned uh, frequency bands. It's for those that are congested. And if you use some alternative means and uh, the cost difference uh, compared with our uh, uh, hours uh, with utilization our service uh, th that would be the fee charged so the idea is to encourage people not to be congested in one spot uh, so people are encouraged to use uh, uh, spectrums that are not so congested now uh, on whether the fees will significantly affect the operational costs now The utilizers, uh, the, the users affected uh, are mainly the telecoms companies, the TV stations, and the satellite companies. Now, if they uh, have to pay these fees for the first two years, uh, it's, there, it's a grace period. In the third year, 40% uh, 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 in the uh, uh, fourth year, uh, third year, 70% only starting in the uh, uh seventy percent in the fourth year and then uh hundred percent in the uh, fifth year so uh it's uh less than hundred three hundred thousand dollars uh per year so it's a very small percentage of the uh operational cost and i don't think it will affect the users generally now if it's a very very small sum for them uh as you say how will there be an incentive for them to switch to better utilization of the spectrum so uh, they will continue in the present utilization uh, since the cost is so low? Uh, I will attempt to answer first. Now, uh, they would look at it in a long-term perspective. Now, if you don't have to pay this fee, uh, now, uh, they may switch to a uh, means that is uh, better for them in the long term and which is scientifically more advanced. Uh, so uh, they, I think they would be uh, value the money saved. Afka? Now, the current situation is that we hope to charge the SUF so that these operators will consider uh, alternative ways. They can continue to use the spectrums and pay the SUF, or they can consider to use less congested spectrums, like uh, higher frequency bands. Uh, now, the disadvantage is that uh, uh, the uh, distance covered is shorter, so if they go from point A to point A B. They might go through an international uh, intermediate destination. Uh, so, uh, but in that case, uh, the utilization rate may be less than seventy-five percent. So they may not be. They may not have to pay any fee, or uh, 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 they can also uh, patronize some uh, 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 private op public operators, and they don't have to pay the uh, SUF. So uh, they, their concerns are both uh, uh, cost and reliability, and they have a few years uh, to review their um, methods of operation. If they continue to use the spectrum, they have to pay the SUF. Uh, now, this is uh, less than the license fee that they have to pay now. Uh, 
uh, Mr. Ma Fong Kok. Now, uh, I question what the Deputy Secretary said. Now, if it's all just uh, $300,000 uh, a year, it's not enough incentive for them to return the spectrum. Now, if you give them the spectrum, you consider it uh, congested. Now, how much is the actual utilization? Now, there are techniques for uh, compression and, and encryption. And also, can there be common use or shared use? Even if you assign the frequency bands, can they use suppression techniques? And say, the cabled news very often there is live broadcast and it is usually done here for example in the building um, what is the usage like maybe you charge them a fee already so they can use the bands but how is the utilization like do you monitor the actual utilization what kind of management or supervision can you have so that you really can ensure that there will be efficient use of frequency bands. Who will take the question? DS, uh, I will kick off and I will defer to the OFCA. Whether this is an incentive, our colleagues have already explained that it's a commercial decision for them to switch frequency bands. We'll, you'll be paying the same cost, but you have a choice of what you want to use. And they can look at it from the commercial angle as Mr. Chosa Leung said um, they would have to be mindful about reliability, etc. That may be one of the considerations of the operator. As to how the utilization is after assignment, perhaps I can defer to the OFCA. Chairman and Mr. Ma, uh, we mentioned the utilization situation just now. I gave you an example and I talked about e news gathering. I might give you the impression that. That means they don't always use the bands, but actually it depends on the nature of the surface. If we are talking about fixed links, they are using the frequency band 24 hours round the clock. It's just like the electricity companies. They use the uh, links in order to check the um, voltage situation and the data is transmitted back to the company every minute. And also some are used by television broadcasters to transmit the data uh, to Chi Wan Shan um, transmission tower in order for that to be beamed to other towers. And as for satellites, you know, the satellites operate round the clock and the information is uh, transmitted to the satellites every minute. So um, about e-news gathering and outdoor broadcasting, that depends whether there are major events. And the broadcasters will make use of the links uh, if uh, there is a major event. That is the special case. If you talk about effective management, as you know, you assign the bands to them, but you can still um, keep some. Uh, these may not be for exclusive use, so when there are major events, they can apply again. Right. Can they make use of the bands only when they need it for a major event, or should you just assign the bands to people? Well, let me supplement. In fact, when the assignment is done, there is uh, exclusive use and also shared use. In fact, every broadcaster or TV station has some exclusive bands and some shared use bands. The advantage is they will be reassured because they have exclusive use of certain bands and there will be no interference. But there is also an advantage with shared use because if they have to go to many places to do broadcasting at the same time, they will be able to use more frequency bands. But it depends on the situation. Uh, they might have to coordinate with other users. Well, coming back, there is another question. At this stage, it seems the SUF charge is not a lot of money. So do you think that is a good enough incentive for people to return frequency bands that are not used? If they should go for optic fiber, for example, uh, if the cost is much higher than as a TV station, I would like to have as many frequency bands as I can. 
that is true for every large organization. Even if I don't use them, I would want to keep them because it's not expensive. Who will answer that question? Let me answer the question. 300,000 is uh, the medium figure. If the eight frequency bands are all charged SUF, that would add up to about $20 million. And over 20 licensees will share that cost. Some may pay uh, a few thousand, some pay millions. But I was citing a medium figure, a median figure. OK, I will continue with my questions. If you don't launch the charging scheme and people continue to congest the frequency bands, what will be the effect? The biggest effect is that, as you know, spectrums are a limited asset. And spectrums are welcome uh, because they are not affected by rain. And therefore, we'd like to have the SUF so that operators will switch to other means. But if companies prefer to use the spectrums, um, even for these eight frequency bands, we are not saying that there cannot be further assignment because some are used only um, in a limited way, say, for example, only from Chiwan Shan to Lama Island. And the same spectrum can still be used in the new territories. We are going to do technical analysis in order to assign a um, spectrum with no interference for them. But then, of course, we expect that there will be more congestion in future. And that is why we want to prevent that kind of further congestion. If some spectrums do not have to be used, we hope they will be surrendered so that other people who are in need in future will be able to use the frequencies. Mr. Ma Fong Kwok, uh, this question comes to my mind as I listen to the discussion. I think this is not a good enough incentive, and perhaps you can consider other ways, and I'm thinking aloud here. The basic spectrum may be very inexpensive or even free because they need them to provide services, but maybe to a certain extent you need you would want to um, set a cost, and then if it is uh, used even more, then you can charge an even higher fee. Do you think there would be a more effective management way? Since they don't you know, if they don't want such a big spectrum, maybe they can consider returning it to you. Have you thought about this kind of tiered charging scheme? Maybe that will be more effective. Mr. Chancellor? Well, this kind of incremental charging scheme, as proposed, has not been considered this time around. As we have explained in the paper, we go for the LCA or least cost alternative, and that is we compare the radio waves and also other ways of transmission. And we are going to charge the cost difference between the two ways of operation. This is subject to a five-year review, and then we can consider whether we want to in introduce incremental fees and the feasibility. This scheme is about to be launched only. Um, we have not even got the legislation to back it. We will have to see whether this scheme is effective. We need to observe it for some time. Well, to me, it would not be very effective because you are talking about 300,000. That is not a big fee at all for a TV station operator, of course, this is a median figure. But even if it's 10 times more, it's not a big sum for ter um, power companies because they have revenue to the tune of um, billions of dollars every year. In other words, idle spectrums will not be returned as a result of this charging scheme. We you want to have uh, idle spectrums returned in order for them to be assigned to other people. So I would ask you to do some micromanagement to see how indeed uh, your charging scheme will be effective in encouraging people to return idle spectrums. Will you go back and uh, consider this? When do you want to launch the charging scheme? I'll take the question. 
since this was actually decided after public consultation in 2011 and the charging scheme was already announced, we have already informed the relevant operators that our objective is to launch the scheme at the end of this year or early next year after Gazetto. Right. I think members' response today is that we are afraid the proposed scheme will not achieve its desired result. Well, thank you for those views. We will keep a close watch after the charging scheme is launched to see how operators are using the spectrums and whether their behavior will change. And if necessary, we will optimize the scheme so more people will leave the congested spectrums. But then, DS, you say you will do a review only after the launching of the scheme, but then this will go on for five years at least, and we'll have to wait for five years before we will review the scheme. And if it doesn't work out, then we still have to allow spectrums to be held by people who don't use them. Well, about spectrum management, the OFCA will be able to let you know more. OFCA. Chairman, we'll need to strike a balance. Between, because right now we are not charging any SUF, and as the chairman and member have said, this may add to the operating cost now that the SUF will be charged. We want to know the impact on the operators. Of course, we don't think there will be a big impact, but to a certain extent, we don't want to pitch the SUF at a very high level so operators um, run into difficulties. We have to balance between effective use of spectrum and the increase in operating cost. That is why we have gone for the least cost alternative approach. We think that is fair. Okay. Uh, Mr. Marvin Kwok, any more views from you? Well, not views as such, but they said. Um, as much, you know, that they are not going to consider doing other things. And I'm going to tell you that this is going, not going to be useful. You will start with a thunderbolt, but then the rain will be small. Well, our view is that uh, we think this is not going to be useful. I don't know whether you share my view. I share your view, Mr. Ma. That is what I was saying. I asked the same question. How much money are we talking about if the median uh, cost is $300,000, then I would think there will be no impact at all, and therefore it is not an incentive. But of course, the OFCA may think that operators may want to save every dollar they can save, and so they would move to other methods. But then if there is not a big incentive, and if they have to do a lot before they can use other idle spectrums, then we think there may not be a lot of impact coming from the scheme, and members are telling you that maybe you can think about other approaches so that the scheme itself will be more effective in the next five years. We hope people will actually surrender, say, half of the spectrums. Then I would call that successful, or else you will be Working on that, the four officials here, your salary will total $8 million. And if uh, there is not a big in enough uh, financial incentive, then I don't think uh, you should just put in the effort and allow the scheme to be unsuccessful. All right, think about it. When you go back, that is all for this item. Item 5 on the agenda, item 4, e-government services. We'll invite another team of administration officers to come in. Okay. 
係咪就咁講？好啊。好誒。誒、um, uh, ，Welcome to the officials. Uh, will you have a briefing? <coughs> uh, no PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, the Under Secretary, please uh, brief us, and then members will ask questions. In order to provide effective, uh, safe public service, uh, the uh, Government uh, Chief Information Officer's Office all along has been trying to provide the up-to-date services, and now uh, the uh, the uh, uh, data gov. Dot .hk portal has 7,000 data sets and 18 categories uh, for the public to use and the uh, various bureaus and departments uh, have developed uh, mobile uh, applications and the government has uh, uh, digitized the process of uh, submitting forms electronically uh, so the public can use e-forms to submit information. And the uh, new uh, gov.hk was introduced in November last year and uh, new uh, designs have been introduced uh, so that uh, different uh, electrical electronic appliances can be used uh, uh, for uh, mobile uh, apps applications uh, can be applied to for uh, for use for uh, uh, payments and uh, uh, the, in the dissemination of information and communications, uh, the bureaus and departments have developed uh, Facebook uh, pages, uh, blogs, and uh, 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 channels for sharing uh, information with the public. Uh, and uh, now the government uh, has uh, uh, increased by 75 per cent uh, uh, the uh, information uh, provided uh, to the public electronically uh, compared to a couple of years ago and the government has made use of new technologies such as uh, uh, cloud technology uh, the uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, and uh, uh, etc. The uh, OGCIO will uh, try to upgrade the information infrastructure uh, facilities and uh, consultants will review the use uh, of uh, cloud facilities and uh, there will be new proposals to uh, build the new uh, generation of cloud facility. Uh, four members have now uh, indicated their wishes to speak. Five minutes each. Uh, Chen Chi Chun first. Now we are talking about e-government. We can criticize for at least an hour. But I'd like to ask a question. Now, is it the uh, gov of the responsibility of the uh, government chief information officer's office, or is it that uh, the departments have not been able to catch up? For instance, uh, paragraph uh, seven says that there are now over thirteen hundred uh, government forms that can be submitted electronically. Now, thirteen hundred, how? much a percentage is that of the total? Is there a target year by which we, we are going to uh, make everything electronic? Now, some very dumb legislations can be uh, advanced uh, with the times. Now, uh, if something can be submitted by fax, they can be submitted electronically, like voters' registration forms. Now, uh, right now, uh, you need uh, e uh, certificate in order to uh, submit to 
uh, process that on the web. Uh, now, very few people have these uh, electronic certificates. Now, uh, actually, uh, you can sign uh, on and then uh, fax it back, so you can do that uh, electronically too. And uh, you uh, can so uh, the RVO may be uh, too uh, rigid. The chief information officer. Now, uh, I'd like to talk about the division of work, of work between the OGCIO and other government departments. Now, the OGCIO uh, will be responsible will provide uh, support uh, such as by cloud technology uh, the schemes or programs uh, uh, that uh, the uh, created by the departments and through this kind of collaboration we can Make better use of e-government now on electron on e-forms. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, the deputy uh, GCIO. Now there are altogether eighteen hundred uh, forms, uh, of which we have uh, made thirteen hundred electronic. Uh, and uh, that's 87 percent, however, of the utilization. Now, uh, there are 14 million uh, users uh, of filling out our forms, and uh, 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 12 million of them are submitted electronically. And is there a timetable? Yes. Uh, now, right now, it's about 87%. By next year, 2018, we will reach, we expect to reach 98%. That's almost all. Now, the remaining 2% are those forms which uh, are almost impossible to be uh, submitted electronically. Uh, because uh, there has to be face-to-face -face, uh, investigation or the forms may be uh, too few in number, so it's not cost-effective. So uh, our study sh indicates that by next year, 98% of the forms can be submitted electronically. Now, these uh, forms are done, uh, the work is done at the department level, uh, but the OGCIO uh, monitors the how this process is uh, carried through in the various departments, and we expect this 98% completion rate by next year. Uh, perhaps the uh, second round, please. Uh, next, uh, Leung Kwok Hong. You said by 2018, the forms, 1,800 forms, 98% of them will be submitted electronically. Now, I'd like to ask how many people make use of that? Now, you develop these forms for them to be filled out electronically. Now. How many of how many people actually fill out the forms electronically? Now there is different utilization for different forms. Now for forms for students, the utilization rate uh, for, uh, by electronic means is very high. Over half the forms are filled out electronically. Now for other forms. 
the utilization rate, ele electronic utilization rate is in the teens. Now, for uh, filing of tax returns electronically, the utilization rate is about 20 percent. Of course, the departments try to promote their e form so that more members of public can make use of that. Is there any incentive for them? Because uh, e-forms uh, save your man hours, right? So uh, it's like uh, when you buy takeout food, you are charged less uh, as an incentive. Now, Mr. Leung Kwok Hong, now when the uh, Deputy GCIO uh, refer to the e-forms. Uh, they are completely filled out on the web. Uh, there is incentive like filing of tax returns electronically, even though it's not a huge incentive. It's not that you pay less tax, but you can extend the deadline for submitting the return. If it's a handwritten return, uh, the deadline is this month. Now, if it's uh, electronic filing, there is an extension of one month. Now, you expect that, like for filing of tax returns, when do you expect to reach 50% uh, utilization? You say that for students, it's over 50%, right? The uh, DGCIO? We do not uh, have an actual uh, benchmark, uh, but with more education and publicity and with more young people using the web, we think the rate will increase. Now, uh, uh, I don't see uh, Mr. Yang uh, so often these days. Now, he talks about big data. Now, you say it's uh, used for analyzing transport figures. Uh, how about data, big data for other use? Now, uh, big data analysis uh, is at an early stage of usage. Uh, now, uh, the uh, OGCIO is uh, uh, working on a platform for big data. It uh, enables the departments to make use of big data technology uh, to conduct the operations and analysis uh, so that the job can be done uh, more swiftly and smoothly. So it's a progression. Uh, uh, we, there will be better utilization uh, starting from now till next year. Is there any plan? Any plan for the use of big data, the DGCIO? Now, it's not mentioned uh, in this document, but I'd like to refer to one or two. Uh, the uh, observatory has a lot of data. Now, we are cooperating with the observatory and with the transport department. Uh, say, on rainy days, can there be analysis of the impact on uh, speed of uh, vehicles? Just give me 15 seconds, Chair. Mr. Chairman, now, uh, when, when there's congestion, there's a lot of confusion. Can you create a model so that when there is uh, some accident, you provide people with the data? For instance, uh, there is an uh, uh, incident at Quarry Bay, then uh, people would be very glad if they can learn about it. We are precisely uh, on talking with the transport department about this, how the weather affects the traffic situation. 
when the data analysis uh, is uh, at a mature stage, we will share this information with the public. Say the MTR stops for one minute or three minutes. Now it causes a lot of confusion. Uh, can you cooperate with the MTRC Corporation on this? Chairman, actually we are doing it. The TD and the MTR are meeting with us on a regular basis. As for the use of big data, we are communicating with them as to how the big data can be used. We can communicate further information to you later. Mr. Ronick Chan. Mr. Ronick Chan. Thank you, Chair. Three questions. Number one, para three, about opening up of PSI for the use of public. This is an international trend. Actually, the panel has asked the administration to quicken the pace many times. You said there are 7,000 data sets in 18 categories, and there are 700 um, portals um, on this data dot gov dot hk and that will increase to one thousand by mid uh, twenty seventeen that there are now seven hundred application programming interfaces. But how much have you done? Are you talking about ten percent, twenty percent or fifty percent of opening up data? OGCIO Our aim is that uh for data dot gov dot hk to open up government information so citizens can make use of the information in order to advocate further development. We are not talking about opening up all information right from the start because we have to seek an understanding with users as to what information would be most useful to developers and we'll start from there because we have to use a lot of resources if we open up all information and if nobody wants the information it is not a way to make the best use of resources but what is the percentage of opening up now as a percentage of total government information we haven't done that statistics. To open up information, it is not just to upload the information we have, because a lot of information has to do with individual particulars and also sensitive information. We'll have to um, redact that kind of information before we can open up the relevant information. So we have to do some collation, consolidation, and if there is information about contracts that have to be has to be kept confidential that cannot be opened up either so we'll have to do something and about the information before it can be opened up second question maybe you don't have the answer but i like to state my view nevertheless about e payment you say that the technology would be or mobile payment technology will be launched this year for consideration by departments. But you don't have an objective, you don't have an aim uh, when you can launch it. Is it 2018 or 2019? I don't think I would have an answer anyway. Number three, para 10, big data. That you are going to uh, use big data in order to tackle cyber threats. Now, it is just said that. Um, the highways office has confirmed that malware has attacked one of the offices for Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge. And in fact, maybe it is not a hacking of the government website as such, but government's contractors. And the information is closely related to a government project. What can you do if there is a uh, hacking by these, um, or hacking of the information? In this case, it is uh, Arab, and in fact, in my bank, for example, there is um, intentional hacking intentionally in order to 
check the effectiveness of the system. Okay, two questions. Chairman, as for the mobile payment technology and timetable, indeed we don't have a very specific timetable and that is for how many departments to use e-payment by when. But within the year, departments will be able to make use of e-payment and accept payment. You mean you will enable them to do so within the year, but it's up to departments to consider whether to use it. I think Mr. Chen has made a very good proposal, and that is we will promote it and we will ask departments to report statistics to us so we know exactly how many departments are using e-payment. As for hacking, the computer of the um, issue is a contractor's computer. Basically, if it is a government computer, we have penetration tests. We pretend to be a hacker and attack the computer to see whether um, hacking is successful. We do that within government, but since this is a computer for a contractor, it is not um, really possible for us to do penetration tests. What we can do is to ask the highways department to liaise closely with its contractors who should know that cyber security is important and that contractors should protect government papers. From what I know, the papers encrypted by malware should not involve any individual's information. And in fact, there is no confidential information either. But we'll continue to increase information security. This is uh, the responsibility of the OGCIO. In our guidelines, it stated very clearly that even if uh, it is a contractor's computer, if it is handling government papers, the department has the responsibility to ensure that the contractor deals with the information in a proper way. Mr. Ma Fung Kwok. Thank you, Chairman. In the paper, um, we think more thoughts can be given to different things. I'm not talking about big data as such. I'm talking about basic data. Maybe for every citizen in Hong Kong, there will be dozens of pieces of information about them, um, address, age, family status. Out of the 1,300 forms, basically over half of them would make use of shared information. Maybe you can allow the forms to share the data. So as long as the ID number is fed in, you do not require the individual to fill in so many blanks. And there will be a lot of streamlining of the procedures. And also you can remind citizens to update their information because every time there is an e-form to be filled in, the information will be shown on screen. The most important thing is cyber security. Have you considered doing that? Because then many departments can share the information. And you can authorize departments to come into contact with the information they need. Secondly, e-payment. Well, Hong Kong is lagging far behind even compared with the mainland. My political group did a survey and asked what the public thought. Most of the public said they were not willing because they were worried about privacy and security. If you can promote this, you can help ensure that your system is safe so you can reassure the public. And then another one. The um, opening up of PSI, you say there are 7,000 data sets and you are going to increase them. But I'm aware that 
your opening up of information is not user friendly. Some systems vary. Sometimes you use PDF, but then if people need to do research, it is not very convenient. Can you consider updating uh, your systems? And also, you said you would provide technology solutions for departments to consider using. I think that is not aggressive enough. You are not proactive enough. You should encourage them to use the technology instead of just asking them to consider adopting it. Because if this will convenience the public, you should be more proactive. OGCIO. And perhaps I can start to answer the questions. Number one. Sharing citizens' information by departments. First, when departments collect information or particulars from citizens, departments have to state very clearly the purpose of that particular collection exercise and the data subjects agreement must be sought. Later on, when we collect citizens' information, whether we can say if you agree, the information can be shared with other departments. I think there is space uh, for us to do better. I can discuss with departments uh, as to whether this is appropriate. And of course, we have to comply with the privacy ordinance. We can take this up with departments. Next, e-payment. In fact, we need to boost different aspects. Uh, for example, how e-payment operators can protect privacy and security. We will explore into that. Say, for example, at present, we are doing a study uh, on EID and also e-cert, e-certificate. Can we make this safer? So different service suppliers can allow e-payment. I think there is space for improvement. And then opening up of PSI and the formats. We are doing many improvement measures now. You mentioned the API application programming interfaces. At the end of last year, we collected views from the industry. And we started to develop the APIs. And within a very short while, and until the middle of the year, there will be 1,000 such APIs. The objective is to convenience developers so they can make the best use of open data. We'll continue to listen to the demands of the industry and we will try to make use of a more convenient format in providing the open data. And also, you say we should be more proactive and we should encourage departments. In fact, that is our approach. In fact, sometimes we don't only encourage. We would make use of other ways and means to make sure that departments will make use of technology. And when they apply for funding, we will ask them many questions in order to make sure that they make use of the best approach. In fact, we have different ways to help departments to be more aggressive. Thank you, Mr. Ma Fong Kwok, for your very good views. Next, Mr. Alvin Young. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to follow up on the question asked by Mr. Ronick Chan, and that is the objective of opening up PSI. I'd like to ask the administration for their policy objective. How much do you want to open up? What is the progress? Have you run into difficulties? Do you need the help of the Legislative Council to take it up with departments? OGCIO, what dif difficulties have you run into? Actually, the objective is to complement the work of the 
sector, and that is how we can disseminate data held by government in an orderly manner for the use of the sector. This is a kind of interactive process. We may not fix a date and say how much information should be disseminated. We continue to talk to departments to open up data. We take the initiative to do that. We also <coughs> gather the requests from the uh, industries and then we discuss with the departments to see whether the information can be uh, opened up. And so it's a two pronged approach to progressively open up government information. Now, of course, in the process, we will take into account privacy issues on whether certain information is to be disclosed. Uh, we have to discuss with the departments. Uh, I, uh, let me interrupt uh, before the GCIO speaks. Now, you wait for the other government departments to respond to you. Of course, from their perspective, of course, uh, the less is better because uh, for bureaucrats, uh, we can understand that they want to do less to avoid mistakes. So uh, whether the bureau or the uh, OGCIO will take the lead to require the departments to submit certain things, I don't think they have the power so in that case, you need our help. Uh, let me give two examples. We are talking about smart city. We hope that the big data can help us. Say in the UK, the Department of Health uh, provides information on the patients and the drugs, uh, and they put that on the big data. And uh, uh, very often, the drugs have substitutes. And if they find substitutes for the drugs, then it saves people a lot of money. It can save uh, two, uh, uh, two, uh, $2.5 billion. So we can find out whether the most uh, expensive or the most uh, widely used drugs uh, have uh, better, cheaper substitutes. And uh, also, there are a large number of tree incidents uh, every year. The tr those in the tree's office uh, have a, a huge amount of work, uh, but the data is available if we can uh, enlist help from the public uh, through the big data. Uh, it will be a big help, uh, the DGCIO. Now, firstly, uh, if the data is now provided, if the information is provided by uh, paper means uh, at present, we request the, uh, the departments to do that electronically instead. Now, we have 7,000 data sets. Uh, uh, now, this is uh, quite a large number compared to other jurisdictions. Now, uh, the member mentioned that there is some information required by the industries or the public. Now, there are already channels for uh, views to be received from, say, from the members, and then we discuss with the departments to see whether they can share the data with the public. Now, some data are internal to the department's concern. Now, big data is a technology. The technology can be used to analyze how the data can be handled within the department to uh, assist people in their daily lives. And this is where the OGCIO comes in. Now, I know that the GCIO and the DGCIO uh, try to inform us and the public, but uh, how much do they do? Like uh, the government website, uh, say for social welfare, Hong Kong invests so much in social welfare. Now, how much data has been opened up and shared? Only three items. 
So the public fails to understand how much can be done, how much you wish to do, how much cannot be done. Now, I don't want to say that they are bureaucratic, but they seem to be rather uh, ineffective. Now, I'd like to hear what strategy in the long term does the government have to become a, to achieve uh, a smart city uh, status for Hong Kong. Your coming smart city blueprint, will you, as Mr. Young said, uh, include a timetable for the departments to fulfill? Now, I was going to supplement. We are working on a smart city blueprint, a consultancy report. Now, uh, on the opening of data, this report will provide some suggestions, and when the consultancy report is completed, we will report on it in the LegCo on the proposals regarding smart city and in this panel we will uh, listen to members views i'd like to mention just one point when it comes to thinking it must be from the user's perspective like for trees the observatory provides me with a lot of information but if i don't have the geographical data i can't do anything I believe the GCIO is aware of this. Mr. Law? Now, uh, the, uh, there's a document submitted by the government. Uh, now, very often we ask the government departments to supply some information documents. Now, they pre provide us uh, w with a PDF file. Now, I cannot use the search function to identify, to find out some key word or key pieces of information, so it's very difficult for me. So I like to ask the GCIO or the departments. Now, the police or other departments or bureaus, uh, is there a standardized uh, format for the government? Now, if you provide a PDF, a document where we can uh, search for certain keywords using uh, Control F, uh, that would be very helpful. The DGCIO, uh, in principle, the PDF should be searchable because we have a guideline for the departments that they need to now if it's uh, a uh, public document, it should be readable by uh, screen readers for the visually handicapped. In that case, the PDF has to be a word PDF and not a picture PDF. Now, earlier, the police uh, uh, supplied a document on police quarters and uh, etc. And it's all uh, a picture by picture PDF. Now, now this is a document uh, uploaded to the LegCo website. Can it be converted to Word PDF? Uh, we will update. We will uh, contact the police. Uh, now this is. Uh, uh, very uh, uh, important for our work, and I hope other de departments will take note of this. The GCIO said that you have engaged a consultant to conduct a study on smart city. Now, concerning the big data, uh, what areas would they study, uh, like uh, uh, digitizing, uh, and uh, timetable, will you be able to share more with us? Now, we are still working on it. It's still being done. Um, I hope that by the end of June or early July, the consultancy report would be completed. 
and then depending on the actual time of completion, maybe in July we will try to come to this panel to share the with members the findings of the consultant. We all agree that big data uh, can improve social issues uh, through the uh, utilization of uh, uh, popular wisdom. Now, uh, now the OGCIO wants to ask the departments to disclose certain information, but it can't be done. Now, I'm afraid that this might again be the case when the study comes out. The departments may not adopt the proposals or the recommendations. Perhaps the LegCo can help the OGCIO so that it can uh, engage in more useful dialogue with the department so that they can be less bureaucratic and provide more pub data to, with the public. Is there anything that the LegCo can help with the uh, GCIO? Now, on this consultant report, it will provide ideas on how to better coordinate among government departments. I think uh, let's wait till the report is completed before we discuss more specifically. No more question from me. Uh, now, I will follow up. Now, just now, many members express concern on e-government, smart city, use of big data, and so on. Now, we are all very concerned, as you can see. Now, we think that uh, Hong Kong can uh, do better, uh, since we already have good such uh, physical infrastructure. Now, uh, on information, we are lagging behind. Now, on every part that uh, is mentioned uh, in your document. Now, for instance, different departments um, work uh, behind closed doors on their own, uh, like for parking uh, apps. Uh, by the time the apps are uh, introduced, they are already uh, outdated. So perhaps the departments have a different understanding and uh, different uh, capabilities with regard to information technology. And we asked about the function of the OGCIO. Actually, you are very passive in your role. If they ask you, do you respond? If they don't ask you, maybe they uh, already came up with their own versions, like for the parking meters, and you are not aware of it. Now, on uh, uh, big data, on uh, uh, cloud, and uh, so on, now you uh, provide some opinions, and the departments may only uh, make use of them after five years, so by then they will be outdated. So how do you resolve that? Now. Uh, this is actually happening. Maybe they listened to your opinion several years ago, but after going through all the procedures and they uh, finally become introduced, they are already uh, backward. So maybe you are uh, working, uh, your consultants are working on smart city or the new generation of uh, electronic ID, now, apart from consultant studies, what else can be done? Now, now on the progress of uh, information technology, we would like different government departments to participate. So you can see that the departments are working on this uh, on their own, and the OGCIO uh, needs to provide a central platform. So in our document, 
we mentioned that in respect of cloud technology and big data, we hope to come up with platforms for sharing of resources so that uh, the the individual departments can uh, do less, uh, like for artificial intelligence. So the OGCIO uh, tries to achieve sharing of resources. Uh, some departments may be more advanced in this regard, uh, some less, uh, but we uh, devote our effort to the creation of the platform. Now on big data, we hope to provide more training so that successful experiences can be shared among the departments. I'm sure when departments know that they can use the new technology, they will be helped in formulating policies and providing government services to the public. Departments are very happy to take part. I understand new technology is developing fast. And as we said to members in the areas of email and cyber security, we are developing in this direction. I hope I can reassure members that our policy is to make use of these approaches so departments will adopt new technology faster. Well, no other members are going to ask questions. Let me also ask a question. Cloud platform, you have launched the government cloud for some time already. How many departments are using it? Deputy uh, GCIO, we have asked departments to make use of the cloud platform when they launch new systems. As to how many departments are using it, well, most departments are using cloud technology to run their systems, but we don't think this is the best way yet because there are two cloud platforms. One kind is private, the other one is public. Later on, we should make use of more public clouds so departments can access the cloud platform more easily. We have mentioned this in para 16 of the paper. The Under Secretary said just now that we would like to standardize things. So whether people use the cloud or big data or other technology, departments do not have to develop their own systems for their own business. And there will then be more incentive for departments to use centralized systems. So they save time and there will be more cost efficiency. This is the direction we are going. We are now doing a study now. Our objective is to complete the study within the year. If everything works smoothly, we hope we can apply funding next year to build more common use systems. You mean you do part of their work and there will be more incentive for them because they don't have to use their own budget. And they can keep the budget for other things. And you are saying that this is an incentive for more departments to use the centralized platform. But uh, what are you going to put on this platform? Well, there will be infrastructure and it is going to be a platform and also application. There can be shared use programs which can be directly used by departments. There will be a few things. 
It will also include the latest technology. So the development application will be more synchronized. Well, most members of the public and also the media are saying that government apps are not user friendly and the utilization rate is low. What can you do to improve the situation? Well, we have these adaptive interface. So last year, we updated the guidelines for mobile apps. We hope the departments don't only launch apps for the sake of launching them. Rather, they should launch apps that are closely related to the lives of the public and that they should allow interaction. In fact, they need not develop um, informational apps. We are writing new guidelines and providing new technology to help departments to disseminate information to the public through interactive apps. And this will improve their download rates. I'd like to also talk about e-government services. Members of the public have to register every time they apply for services. We always talk about single sign up. What is the progress in this regard? Chair, we already have my government. Members of the public just have to register once. That is the name uh, of the individual, and they will be able to use the, the uh, services. And we are adding more departments into this website. When you answered other members, you said that uh, there are a thousand odd forms which can be filled out electronically. So are you talking about um, a difference between tens of tens of uh, dozens of forms or tens of thousands of forms. If a member of the public holds an account in the government system, and if their basic particulars are there and which can be updated as well, and any department can access that account, like. Um, name, ID, card number, telephone number, address, all that should not have to be filled in every time. This is what I mean by single sign up. And for the citizens to hold an account in uh, e-government, is this within your planning? We'll give full consideration when we construct e-identity so we can apply it across the departments. E-identity is one thing, but e-identity can be assigned and it might not have anything to do with application of e-services. In some places, Many years ago, the public would already be able to hold an account in e-government and the citizens' relationship with the government from birth can all be checked from that account and of course, um, changing the information is possible and in fact, citizens can also check whether they have any um, penalty tickets outstanding and even their School uh, results are also in that account. In the long term, you should help every citizen to set up such an account in e-government. Then we can accomplish what we have been asking you to do. We haven't heard you say anything like that. Even with big data, everything is still chopped up. Cloud platform is one, big data is one, e-identity is another. But there should be basic infrastructure 
so every citizen can have an account in e-government. We haven't heard you say anything about that. Well, I was answering Mr. Ma. And that is when we collect the public's particulars. We can seek a one-off consent so we can keep the information in an account for f shared use by government departments. We need first to seek the consent of citizens first. Then we can collect and share the information. This is our direction. Well, I haven't seen any documents on this from the administration. You say to seek the public's consent, but first you need to consult the public. Will you include this as part of your e-identity exercise? Will the consultant be looking in that? Well, this will be included under the Smart City Consultancy. This will be included in the chapter of Smart Government. Other members, any questions? Mr. Ronick Chen, a very short one to follow up on what you asked, Chairman, and that is the apps of governments. If you look at the 20 major government services, the first six belong to the observatory. So it occupies six places out of the 20 most commonly used e-government services. Members of the public need to search for weather and the transport situation. But if you look at the TDs apps, they are not included in these 20 major services. We, you may not know why, so I, I'm not going to ask it. But rather, I know the TD website has been quite costly in its development. Now, if the development cost is up to a certain level, is there a me mechanism for the departments to review the utilization rate from time to time so as to stimulate the departments to make improvements, maybe to improve their interface so more people will be attracted to use it. The departments have to give us returns after they have launched the service, like the utilization rate, updating, and also improvement measures. We ask for that information. And as a matter of fact, Departments have to improve their e-government services based on those returns. Mr. Chan um, asked us whether we know why there is low usage. This is because the TD has opened up the data. A lot of data has been uploaded. So in fact, there is no need for them to create an app to disseminate information. And some of the information is provided by the market. And uh, that kind of information attracts a high usage. Well, this is a good direction. We hope more departments will be happy to open up data to provide service. Mr. Chen, I support that direction. When you evaluate whether the departments should spend so much money to improve uh, data dissemination, then how can you give differential treatment to the TD in such a situation. When they apply for funding, we will request them to give us the usage information. If the usage is low, but the development cost is high, we are not going to approve it. OK, any more questions? Mr. Ted Hoy, thank you. Sorry for being late. Para 9 of the paper, it says uh, you would enhance communication with the public. There are 30 Facebook pages and 10 blogs. I'd like to ask you whether you have evaluated the effectiveness of Facebook pages. As you know, um, people react differently to different pa Facebook pages. Uh, there are highly paid officers who only play with Facebook, they say, and they seem not to be hardworking. And sometimes they make use of the page to promote themselves and the government, and it is not real communication. Uh, can you let us know 
how these pages and blocks are used, how who are operating them, and how can you make sure there is real communication? OGCIO, how bureaus make use of um, the social media in order to communicate with the public. It is up to the bureaus to decide. We now, different bureaus uh, use different channels and they employ different resources for those channels. And we find that the social media <coughs> are a uh, means of communication that is uh, well diversified. And on how to better utilize it, uh, it's of course not just having such a Facebook web page. Uh, it depends also on the content, and different departments or bureaus make their own choices on how much resources to be employed on different channels. And I think. As time goes on, uh, there will be more and more arrangements. So what is your role when you tell us that the department will have Facebook page and a blog now, and you say that they will develop on their own? Will you provide them with guidelines or goals? And what percentage of the uh, total expenditure is to be spent on by, uh, and a timetable and so on. Yes, uh, we provide guidelines on security uh, because if people invade their accounts, uh, then the uh, data can be modified. So it's technical guidelines. Any more questions? If not, we thank the officials, and we hope we can have better e-government. We hope that Smart City Consultancy Report uh, would be forthcoming soon. And item uh, number five, other matters. Uh, it's next meeting, uh, 12th of June, 2.30 p.m. Thank you.